It's one of those great unsolved Australian mysteries, one I've wondered about all my life. And now we've finally got the solution. It all begins 75 years ago, back in March 1932. You've probably seen it in the old newsreels. The Premier's poised to cut the ribbon and officially open the brand new Sydney Harbour Bridge. Up rides Captain Francis de Groot. With a flashing sword, he slices through the tape, leaving old Jack Lang fuming and the grand opening in uproar. Now, we've always known what happened to the captain, but that sword of his has been missing for 75 years. Tonight, as the old girl celebrates her birthday, the answer to the mystery. Come with me as we solve the greatest mystery of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Kept hidden for 75 years, pursued by historians and treasure hunters. It's here, the Holy Grail, locked away in a sealed Sydney basement. Well, Peter, here we are. This is it. This is it. History. The very first time this will be seen in this country. OK, let's do it. Let's, let's do, it. do it. Let's do it. We'll unlock this secret very soon, and I promise it'll be worth the wait. But first, I want to introduce you to the real custodians of the bridge. Come on up to the top. Best job in the world? Best job in the world. Couldn't be anywhere else. And it's a bloody good view. She may be 75, but it's young blokes who look after the grand old dame. They've spruced her up for today's birthday party and listening to rigger Michael Karras, you'd swear it was a temperamental lover he was fussing over. I do love the old girl. At times she might get upset. You know, like when it's cold in winter, we know she's upset. We need to warm her up, put the tools on her, clean her all up, make her all warm. And when it's hot here, we know we need to protect her by putting an extra layer of paint on her. Spend a bit of time up here and you really do start to see the world in a different light. Magic doesn't begin to describe it. But don't believe everything you hear. Now I've always understood that it takes a year to paint the bridge. They start at one end and finish at the other and then start again. Um, well that's actually a myth. Um, we do paint it constantly, we are painting it constantly to protect the steel. Um, but um, it takes a, a bit longer to do it than just one year. You've just ruined a good story. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Engineer John O'Donnelly looks after the cranes, the workhorses of the mighty bridge. And every New Year's Eve, he has the best seat in the house. You're really amongst it up there with um, all the fireworks just sort of blasting off about, you know, 10 metres away from you. So, yeah, it's amazing. I think I want to change jobs. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad working here, not bad at all. All the riggers tell me that when it rains, the bridge, the old girl can get a little moody. Yeah, the mood changes, but it's always changing, Peter. You know, this, this... Of all the blokes who've had a life-changing experience out of the bridge, it's difficult to beat Paul Cave, the entrepreneur who convinced the authorities to let tourists climb the arch and turned his passion into his fortune. It really did start when I met my father-in-law-to-be as a 19-year-old. In fact, came home from a date and, and he, uh, he came out with this collection of his. And in particular, he brought out the ticket that he'd acquired on the day the bridge opened. And I carry that ticket with me all the time. So it's from Wynyard to Milson's Point, all those zeros and a one. And on the back, of course, it's dated the 20th of March 1932, which was the date the first public train crossed the bridge. This is a man who's explored every hidden crevice. Tell me about this tunnel, Paul. Uh, Peter, this is amazing. This is uh, one of the original tram tunnels. Uh, and when he offered me a tour, we didn't start on the bridge, but deep underneath it, in the subterranean tram tunnels, long abandoned. So, a, a rifle range? Yes, we're emerging. What another great use of a tram tunnel, hey? All this ammunition. And the old tram tracks, the original tracks. The original tracks. 1932 tracks. Still here. 
The tunnels were just the beginning. Soon, 2,000 men were at work on the biggest building project the country had ever seen. The old order changes, and now arises the steel colossus of a new age, Sydney's Harbour Bridge. It was the time of the Great Depression, and Sydney, like much of the rest of the world, was divided into the haves and have-nots. One bloke who found work on the bridge was a rigger named Felix Faulkner, a man who'd learned his trade and earned his nickname on the old sailing ships. They used to go up the mast, and uh, you know they'd skin up the mast, and they'd just go up with, with no aid, no ropes, nothing, and, uh, and that's why he got the name as Felix. What, Felix the Cat? Felix the Cat, that's what they called him. Jacqueline, now 79, remembers her dad as the most handsome man she'd ever seen. To me, he was a beautiful man, and I believe he had a more chasing him. <laughs> and I was told this by Mum, because she was very... She, was, uh, she chased him for four years. So he was Felix the Cat when it came to the girls too? He was, definitely. Every day, Felix would set off to work at 4am, setting massive steel girders into place 130 metres above the harbour, as high as the Eiffel Tower. Remember, these were the days when safety at work meant wearing a pair of rubber shoes. You just had to rely on a certain amount of luck. And on the 30th of March, 1931, Felix Faulkner's ran out. Up here, high above the water, the crane driver was lifting a massive steel plate into place. Somehow, the cable snapped and the plate came crashing down, the cable whipping behind it like a snake. Now, Felix Faulkner was sitting on a girder like that. He could hear and see the plate coming towards him, but he was helpless to do anything about it. Uh, of course, it crushed his legs and the femoral artery, you know, he bled to death. When they did come down then, I mean, he was, he was already dead. The sister said that he'd passed away. Felix's wife, Louisa, was left with four young children and no money. When he didn't come home, I think she was just broken hearted and that he left her. So that was sad. Sad for her, you know. The bridge would eventually cost the lives of 15 of Felix's workmates. It was an engineering feat of dazzling ambition. The two sections met to a fraction. Remarkably, the whole bridge took only seven years to complete. And when the last of the six million rivets was finally hammered home, the whole country downed tools to celebrate. Such a sight has not before been seen in Australia. Below us now are countless thousands of sightseers. Roadways black with people, buildings gay with flags, the great pageant winding its way towards the bridge. The bridge which is about to be made available. For Jack Lang, the fiery New South Wales Premier, things were about to go very wrong. Captain Francis de Groot, a First World War cavalry officer and a member of the right-wing New Guard movement, was furious that Lang had taken it upon himself to open the bridge rather than the King. Suddenly, an officer galloped forward, brandishing a glittering sword and shouting, in the name of common decency, I declare this bridge open. He slashed the ribbon. On his third slash, managed to, to cut that ribbon. Uh, it was really an incredible excitement and catastrophe that this happened, uh, but he pulled it off. There was chaos. De Groot was hustled away and the ribbon quickly rejoined. But take a look at Jack Lang's face. The Premier was not amused. Still, the celebrations went ahead. Many of the floats depicted early Australian historical events, while others glamorised our surfing movement with these good sorts and good sports. The Groot was hauled before the court the next day and fined a measly five pounds. In the end, the only thing that stuck was the malicious damage of the ribbon. Uh, <laughs> the 
job was easy. I merely joined wearing my uniform, which I wore in France. De Groot became almost as famous as the bridge itself, but eventually returned to Ireland and died there. His infamous sword disappeared, a priceless slice of Australian history gone, vanished, many feared forever. One man has spent 20 years searching in vain, until now. So this is it. This is it. This is the moment. This is the moment. Let's open it, shall we? Let's, yeah, let's do that. Magnificent. Magnificent. So Francis de Groot, his bookmark said, the sword is mightier than the scissors. He certainly had a sense of humour, didn't he? <laughs> he surely did, yes. It says, carried by Captain F.E. de Groot during 1914-1918 war and used by him to cut ribbon at opening of Sydney Harbour Bridge, 19th March, 1932. What does this mean to you to have this sword? And do you think to Australia? Uh, uh, Peter, well, to me, it's the Holy Grail. I mean, the ticket's the first thing, and, and this, to me, this is this symbolises what the bridge, I guess, means to me. It's lovely, and it's a great thrill to be able to bring it back here to Australia. Uh, this sword will make some uh, special appearances to, to raise money for charity, uh, uh, starting with cancer. Insured for a lot of money? Insured for a lot of money. Insured for a million dollars, yes, yes. It and needs to be protected. <laughs> am I allowed to touch it? Oh, please do, please do. <laughs> to think that De Groot sliced the ribbon on his third attempt with this blade. Yes, yes, yes. Holding uh, history. Yep, holding history. 75th birthday history. I feel very special. So do we. <laughs> For the Faulkner family too, today is a happy day. They've come to celebrate a birthday and to honour the father they barely knew. Jacqueline and her older sister Olive, now 81, and their younger brother Noel, 77. When you see the bridge, how do you see it? And I'm sure it's very different to the way I see it. When I see the bridge, I think of him, and I sort of think of him there, and, and then I... And when, on the night when they have all the things, all the crackers going off, you know, for New Year's Eve, I, I sort of feel it's beautiful for him. He's got his monument. Yes. The bridge. Yes, it is. And he couldn't wish for anything better. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.